around the world, you need to understand that. I don't know if you really understood the power of what she just said. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about Uganda because Uganda I know. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Uganda the first time, there's some mosques, but they're in Kampala. When I went the second time, there's mosques in different villages, right? Mm -hmm. When I went the last time, there's mosques in just about every village. Yeah. And here's what they do. They come into the poorest villages and they say, oh, wow, you have no education for your children. Let us bring you a school. Oh, no, 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 we have no money, we can't pay. That's okay, you can, your children can come for free. Aren't you gonna send your kids? Don't you want a better life for your kids? Of course you do. So they send their ch kids to school. They come in, they build a school. Then they build a mosque attached to it. Your kids are taught and indoctrinated in the Muslim religion. After a couple of years, when everything's completed, here's what they say. If you do not convert, your child can't come to school anymore. You know that free medical care you've been getting? You don't get it. All of your neighbors have converted. You are now going to be rejected if you don't join our church. And what do the, what do the Ugandans do? They convert. And it was amazing to me how many Muslim mosques have sprung up in the last six years. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Look for the grace. But pray against that. It is like a red tide or something, you know, coming in. How many of you need direction? Okay, you know, the joke is always that guys won't stop and ask. <laughs> but I don't think that's necessarily so. Well, some guys won't. But I hate to stop and ask for direction. You know, the first one, I was first here that first few months, I had to go to a conference at the Westin. I had to go for six days in a row. I got lost all six days. <laughs> the, first, the first that day I got lost took me 45 minutes. <laughs> this is not a big island. I told Mike, I said, I keep getting lost. And he goes, well, if you keep driving, you'll come back to the same place. <laughs> okay. I, seriously, and I'd say, okay, now I have it. Tomorrow I'm going just this way. Would I get there? No. <laughs> I'd end up somewhere else. And hey, you know what was right down this road? Yeah, it wasn't that road. <laughs> and I got lost every single time. I was late every day. Every day. I was lost. And some of us are lost in our walk. Some of us hope we know what we're doing. We think we might know where we're going. We kind of, sort of hope. But you need to seek direction. How many times have you heard people wonder, what's God doing? What is he doing in my life? What is he doing? Why is he doing this? What's going on? How's he going to do the thing I want him to do? How? I think I heard him say this, but how's that going to happen? How am I going to get there from here? You pray with them. You pray for them. And then when you reply with confidence, now I've heard from God. This is what's happening. Doubt me then. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy your resolve to do what you think God's going to do. Yeah, it comes in. It's either in your mind or from some voice. God didn't tell you that. No, I thought he did. Of course he did. No, he didn't. God would never say that. Well, I thought he did. I don't know if see the flip. How do you hear from God? I've had so many people say, I want to hear from God like you do. No, you don't. You want to hear from God like you do. I want to be where you are in your walk. No, you don't want to go through the things I've been through. You want to go through your walk. You don't want to go through my walk. Which is pretty miserable because I have some pretty stubborn things going on. But how do you hear from God? Somebody told me the other day, I wish I could hear from God like you do. Really? How do you think I hear from God? Well, he just talks to you. Okay. Really what happens is, sometimes I have a knowing inside, but a lot of times I see a vision, or a picture, or I start to see something. I have a girlfriend, and she's an artist, and she was like, I never hear from God like you. Of course you don't. You don't have my ears. You have your ears. You know? And I said, well, she goes, well, you see things. I don't see things. Okay. She goes, I don't hear things. Okay, you don't hear things. What do you see? Well, I just see, like, colors. <clears throat> well, what does that mean? She goes, like, God, I feel like God's in the room, and there's this anointing, and then I start seeing these brush strokes, like orange. 
Well, I've never seen a brush stroke. <laughs> have you asked him what that's about, or have you looked at it? No. Well, let's explore that. She goes, okay. Yeah, so next time you see brush strokes, just start speaking out what God's showing you. And she saw this huge prophetic painting. And as soon as she started speaking out, she said, God speaks to me. But it's different than you. In 1 Samuel 3.10, the Lord came and stood calling as at other times. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Do you speak, have him speak because you're listening and you're hearing? Or do you ignore his voice when he speaks? Are you so busy saying, I can't hear from God, I don't hear from God, I don't hear from God, I don't hear from God, that you don't hear him? Because you're busy going, la, 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 la. We do it a lot of times. You know, the first time when God spoke to Samuel and we ran in, you know, to Eli, finally he said, you realize this is God talking to you? Sometimes we need somebody to point out the fact that God's really speaking to us, and then we need to go back and say, speak, for your servant hears. In Hebrews 3, 7, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, you can choose not to hear his voice. You can choose. You know, next week we're going to put the front rows in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you and then will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. If you call to God, he's going to answer you. If you are telling me you don't hear from God, you didn't call. Because one of you is not telling me the truth. I'm voting that it's going to be you. God, believe what God said. He said if you call, he will answer. Not only is he going to answer, he's going to tell you great and wonderful things. Why not? Why wouldn't he? We're called his friend. John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know his master's wisdom. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. He doesn't call us servants. We're not the slaves in Egypt. We're none of that. We're friends. Don't you love it when you have a good friend? A good friend that calls you up and says, hey, you want to go do this? Or a good friend that calls and says, you know, you were just on my heart today. Are you doing okay? Don't you love when friends care about you? Don't you love it when you walk in a room and you see somebody's face smile because they're happy to see you? Don't you like that? God calls you friends. He's waiting for you to come in the room. He wants to see your face. He wants to hear you talking to him. He wants you to call him up when you have a problem so he can pray with you and talk with you. Do you keep secrets from your true friend? No, you share everything with them. You know, you can have a word on your finger and, I don't know what guys, but girls will say, I got this word on my finger and I don't know how to, you know, we talk about some of the stupidest things. We share everything. We're totally transparent. And then when we're around God, we're like, hey. <laughs> oh, God. I just want you to know. You know, like he doesn't already know. So we're hiding things from God because why? Because we're so whatever. <laughs> God created man to fellowship with. He didn't want to be alone. Mike and I are watching this show. It's a survivalist show. Yes, it is. And I love every single minute of it. I mean, I just sit there. And I love it. They're out in the wilderness. And they're, it's cold. And it's rainy. And it's miserable. And they got to find everything they need. They can only take two items. And they're totally alone. But you know what? They're not. One thing I've discovered in watching this show is the ones who have wives miss them. And they'll go home. And right now, there's a missionary on there who's very lonely. His wife to home is very lonely. And what he's realized is, it's not good for man to be alone. And the thing that makes them leave before anything is loneliness. It is not good for man to be alone. You need friends. Jesus is waiting. You know, and I hear people say, well, I need a flesh and blood friend. You know what? There is nothing better than the Lord as a friend. Because your real friend will let you down. 
That's why I always apologize in advance. You know, if I start a new Bible study or something, I'm going to hurt your feelings. I'm going to step on your toes. I'm going to whatever. I apologize now. Please forgive me. Now let's move on. <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> Jesus wants to communicate with us. God wants to communicate with us. They call us kings and priests. Do kings of nations rule and never know what's happening in the nation? No. If they do, they're going to get overthrown. Okay? Do priests lead people without knowing which way they want them to go? No. It's not to say there haven't been kings who ruled in darkness. Or priests who led people astray. But let's just look at it logically. Why would God, a loving God, right? A loving God. First, we have to accept that first. He is a loving God. Why would a loving God who gives titles and positions to the people that he created and sent his son to save them, to keep them out of the dark, in the, is that, and, and keep them out of the dark, and then why would he take away the light and put them in darkness and let them wander around hoping that they can find which way God's leading them? God doesn't do stuff like that. Is that the position of a loving God, or is that a demonic jokester? How do you see that? Another position God bestowed on his people is heir. Heir to what? You know, we don't understand the whole line of royalty and heirs. and What, what does that even mean? How can you be an heir if you don't even know what your heritage is? Have you read the will? If you knew that you were an heir to somebody who died and that they were going to leave you millions of dollars, you'd go to the reading of the will. You'd want to know how much was yours, right? And probably fight for whatever you didn't think that somebody else should have gotten. Well, you know what? The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Get in there and read the will and find out what the enemy's trying to steal from you and get it back. Amen. Don't let him have it. It's your inheritance. It's your heritage. Don't let him have it. Get it back from him. In Romans 8, 17, Paul said, Now, if we are children, then we're heirs. Right? Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. How many of you have suffered in your life? Some of you suffered just waking up this morning. <laughs> I mean, you did. Some of you suffered a lot to wake up this morning. So now we can share in his glory. Right? According to this verse, we share in the sufferings of Christ and in the glory of Christ later as heirs and co-heirs. A co-heir is pretty cool. That means you're on equal footing here with Christ underneath the whole heir thing. That's awesome. The term of... The term heirs of God emphasizes our relationship to God the Father. As his children, we have an inheritance that can never per perish, spoil, or fade because it's kept in heaven. 1 Peter 1 4. The Greek term translated heirs in Romans 8 17, which is the one I read, refers to those who receive their allotted possessions by the right of sonship. In other words, because God made us his children, in John 1 12. We have the right to receive the full inheritance. Not a piece, not a chunk, not a crumb off the table, the whole thing. So here's my question. How can two people walk together if they're not agreed? If I'm walking with Mike and we're holding hands and he's going that way and I'm going that way, we don't hold hands very long and we're not together. And you have to know, I've already explained to you that I get lost easily, correct? <laughs> So you have to know that a lot of times when I'm walking with Mike, he has to put his hand on my shoulder or back on my neck so that I go in the direction he's going because I just wander along. I mean, you can take me to the mall and I might not be able to find the door. You can leave the mall and I will have no idea where the car is. I have... <laughs> Two can walk along because we're agreed. I'm agreed that I have no idea where I'm at and he knows where we're going. Come oh, on. There should be a big one. <laughs> 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 that, that is a problem. <laughs> I always act like 
I know where I'm going, and then I realize I have no clue. <laughs> How do you walk with God? Do you walk in agreement with Him? Or do you demand your own way? Do you easily step off the path of agreement because your own thought patterns grab your own thought patterns draw you away from that loving relationship? Does your own pride probably disguised in false humility ouch keep you from knowing his destiny and his direction for your life? Have you exalted your intellect above his understanding of who you are and what you need in your life? I was helping a friend with the Durant once. Only because I knew how to buy, drive a big truck. So I'm coming from Lawton, Oklahoma, and we're going to Durant. I have no idea where Durant is. But, you know, I'm in this big truck, and she's got this errand to run, and I'm not really worried about getting there because I'm going to follow her. Right? I know how to follow. You get in the big truck, you line it up behind the little car, and you just stay there. No big deal. And she goes, I just have to run an errand. Let me go drop this off, and I'll catch up with you on the freeway. Because in where I was, you know, in Oklahoma, the, the speed limit's 70 miles an hour, you know. But my truck would only drive 45 because they put a governor on, so you can't speed. So there's no way that she is not going to not only catch up, but be bored trying to not get ahead of me, right? So that's fine. I get in this truck. And I'm driving along. I mean, I can't even drive the speed limit. I know that I'm going east. If you look at a map of Oklahoma, which none of you care about looking at, I'm sure. So if you look at it facing you, Houghton's down over here in the corner, and Durant's somewhere on this side. Not any big deal. We're just going to drive interstate across the freeway, right? No problem. So I'm driving. I mean, she's going to lead. I don't have a problem getting there. I don't know where I'm going, but, you know, that's not unusual. And I'm driving and driving. And driving, and driving, and I'm thinking, this has been a long time. <laughs> I know she drives a silver car, uh -oh. but I really have no idea where Durant is. Now again, if you look at the map, Lawton's over here in this little corner, Durant's on this side, but I think it's up by Tulsa. But if I'm up by Tulsa, what am I doing on this interstate? I should be on that other interstate, which is north. What if I got on the wrong one? So I'm driving, and I'm driving. I think it's up by Tulsa. I better look in my purse and go buy a map. Reach for my purse. Oh, yeah, I put my purse in the back seat of her car. <laughs> Still there. <laughs> Well, I'm not ashamed to ask for directions, so I'm going to go pull into the next whatever, pull out some change, go in and buy a soda, and ask for directions. No change in my pocket. I have no money whatsoever. I'm in a truck. I have no idea what direction I'm going. I have no money to buy a map, and I'm driving a 28-foot truck. It's not like I'm just pulling in anywhere. And I was kind of embarrassed about the whole thing, to tell you the truth, because I don't really know where I'm going, I just know I'm going to Durant. So here I am, driving, embarrassed, proud. It's hard to pull off with this truck. Use the truck for an excuse, false humility. It's too hard to pull off with this big old truck. Park. So, well, I was going to do it when I had money, you know. So anyway, I won't go into all the details, but it was one of the most miraculous trips that I've ever been in. Even to the point of when I finally got to Durant, I had no idea where I was going. I knew that her ex-husband owned a restaurant. I didn't even know his name. I mean, Durant's a university town. How am I going to find it? Plenty of restaurants in university town. I pulled into a car wash and sat in the car and prayed with tongues. Sat in front of prayed with tongues until a man walked up and I said, Sir, give a poor. How embarrassing mm. to be at the end of the Lord said he would follow me if he loved me. Mm. Let's go back to the driving the truck. Here I am in this truck with no direction, no idea, lost. This is a 
time when you would want to seek God. <laughs> this is a time when you would want to be confident that you hear from God, right? And I'm pretty confident that I hear God's voice. It's the voice of my best friend, the love of my life, the one who changed my circumstances when I was in sin, the one who healed me when I was ill, and the one who set me free from so many bondages. This is the one who knows my heart. The one who gives me direction, shows me how to pray and delights in me like nobody else ever has. This is the one who reveals himself to me every single day. So let's go back to the one who gives me direction. And you know, I'm really not spiritual. I do not fit people's view of what you're supposed to do, say, in half life. So I pray the most, I, I just don't fit in a religion box. And I prayed. A normal prayer for me, but totally the most unspiritual prayer ever. Okay, God, where am I at? <laughs> Nothing. No answer. Uh, God, you busy? <laughs> Isn't it crazy that we can make God so small that we forget He knows every hair on our head, and He has a number. He knows every bird, for goodness sakes. <laughs> uh, God, you busy? Nothing. Uh, excuse me, God, you led the rebellious Israelites out of the wilderness, through the wilderness, and I'm not being rebellious here, and I need some help. Where am I headed? Durant. <laughs> that was clear as a bell, God. Uh, I, uh, I could use a little more here. Where is it? Nothing. Can you get me there? His response made me laugh. Do you trust me? First of all, it was a dumb question. Can you get me there? Duh. I got the Israelites from Egypt. No. Can you get me there? Of course. What's not the trust? As I said when I started this, God's a loving God. He has our best interests at heart. He wants to communicate with us. I heard nothing else. I was driving along, and I kept laughing, and I said, okay, I'm going to drive. You tell me when to turn. And in this trip, this five and a half hour trip that turned into seven, God refined my hearing in a way nothing else could have done. Now, I could have turned to fear instead, pulled off the road, and waited for someone to come and rescue me. Or I could refine my hearing and follow the voice of the Lord, follow his leading, and go in the direction he said. I picked it up. I'm driving, God, you tell me when to turn. Nothing. So I kept happy, driving. I knew he agreed, he didn't tell me no. Right? Sometimes we're waiting for an entire speech. You want a dissertation. And really, silence is all we need. Wow. So he and I began to talk. I mean, because obviously, I'm not a quiet person. <laughs> So we began to talk. We talked about Moses. We talked about the faith of Moses. We talked about the temperament of Moses. God showed me that mine was much the same. Not the pretty, faith-filled part. The knee-jerk reactions, responses. And he asked me to get them under control. Ouch. Then he talked to me. He'd been talking to me in a long time about anger. I used to go into a rage. I used to go into a red rage when things did not go well. And he said, no more of that. Ouch. You know, God, we're driving here. and well, Usually when you're driving with someone and you're having a conversation with them, it's not them telling you all your bad stuff. <laughs> but he'd been talking to me a long time about these things. And now we, have, we are having a very long and, and wonderful conversation filled with love. No condemnation. These are things you need to get under control. Okay. Every time I thought I was better, he would bring it up again, particularly with the rage. That's one of the things I really love about God. He does things in small doses. He never gives us the big picture and then sits back while we struggle to get to the goals that he presented. He gives us what we can handle at the time, gives us all the direction we need, cheers us <coughs> on, salutes our victories, and he does everything that he can to make it, make it so that we can get to the place he showed us today. 
There's nothing up there in God saying, well, if you can do this. And yet, how many of us have talked about that's who God is? As the Bible said the other day, and every single woman at the table believed that we're raised and taught in church that God was the big meaning, sitting up there waiting with a big stick to knock you on your head for everything you do. Why would he send his son for that? Not him. As soon as we decide to do what he says, he already won. It's just a matter of walking up with us. Are you going to trip and stumble? Probably. Step over the rocks. Find a mentor that can show you the pitfalls. Follow what they tell me. Step over. Move on. You don't have to be in the muck and the mire. You don't have to stumble and fall. You're going to stumble around. Sure, everybody stubs your toe, but so what? There isn't a reason for shame. You don't stub your toe, sit down in life and say, stubbed my toe, I'm never walking again. <laughs> That's it. I knew I couldn't do it. It's just too hard. I don't know why I was created to walk. I can't walk and it's just, oh, what a, did you see what I did to my toe? Never going on. I'm going back. <laughs> going back to what? Crawling. You know? It's just crazy the things we think in our spiritual walk. Oh, that was so hard. There's no way that I can go forward. Where are you going to go back to? I told the Lord one time, I said, this walk is just too hard. I, I give up. And he goes, well, great. What are you giving up for? And I said, well, I don't know about that part yet, but I, it's just too hard. I, I can't go on. I've given up drinking and smoking and drugs and and promiscuity, and I'm just rattling off all the stuff I gave up, and he goes, yeah, that was just such a great life. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you give up me, where are you going? <laughs> well, I just want to repent for that one statement. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't, where are you going to go? Wait, you know, the picture of somebody sitting on the ground saying, I have a stubbed toe, I can never walk again, is just hilarious to me. And yet that's what we do in our walk. Instead of asking for direction. This is why when God brings up something a second time, a third time, or a hundredth time, it does not mean you're failing. It doesn't mean you're failing. It means you're taking another step to victory. Another step to victory. That's what it's about. Lots of my friends think that God puts these huge tasks out there and then he sits back to see if we can actually do them. Maybe I'm simple. I don't think that's God. I think he watches. We live in a fallen world. A lot of things come our way. I think he watches and he encourages us on how we handle the task. But just like the pebble in the, in the ground, step over it. You don't need it. Just in the way. I have a threefold cord on my side. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. How can I fail it in How can you? As we talked about Moses, I thought about how hard Moses' life was. He didn't have the Holy Spirit to guide him. Not like we do. But he followed God in a way that was jaw-dropping. About the time, about that time, God said. Take this exit. This was a huge step of faith in the opposite direction of Tulsa. Remember the map? Lot in Oklahoma? Tulsa? Durant. I'm over here. And he said, go right. Well, but uh, Tulsa's... Do you, are you sure you know where Durant is? Yes, do you? <laughs> well, obviously I didn't or I wouldn't have been asking. How many times do we question God like he doesn't know what the end result is? Instead of just saying, okay, let's go. Enough said. This was an adventure, to say the least. We talked, I praised. I had a great time of intercession for so many people. I told him how very much I loved him in the peace and the quiet of a truck. All following the voice of God. And occasionally I would hear it turn left at the next corner or go straight through this light. I was on the back roads of Oklahoma, people. <laughs> Some of these roads, my truck's barely big enough to go down. You know? It was totally uneventful, and yet it was a milestone in my walk with God. 
I became more confident in his voice. And when he says, turn here in my life now, I turn. Because he knows where I'm going. It's caused a lot of anguish in my life. It's caused a lot of consternation in people. And it's been, I've been rebuked over and over and over. But I know his voice and the voice of a stranger I do not follow. Have I missed it? Of course. Usually it's when I'm listening to someone else telling me that I missed God. Then I stop praising and praying. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was starting to question if I was really hearing his voice. You know those voices and we start hearing, are you sure you heard from God? Are you nuts? Who do you think you're talking to? I mean, you know, does God care about all this whole stuff? And I said, God, please, I just need a sign. Okay, now I'm going to admit to you, this is not something that you really want to do often because eventually you have to mature up enough to actually hear him. But if you need a sign, ask for a sign. God, I need a sign. I know I'm hearing your voice, but I'm, you know, I'm fighting all these fears and doubts and wonders and, and you know, these things that boy are you full of yourself. You think you're so cross that God's gonna talk to you in a frock. You know, and I've been fighting this for hours, and I just need a sign, God. And I could hear the laughter of God as I pulled into this little bitty town with a four-way stop, and here is a hand-painted sign on cardboard with paint still dripping and an arrow. Durant. I don't know how fast the angel had to put that up. <laughs> that was my sign. I don't ask for a sign much anymore. I cracked up. I was nailed to a telephone pole. I knew an angel just hung it up. I thought about getting out and seeing if the paint was still wet. God is hilarious and he is playful and he loves us and I love that about him. Obviously, I, made, I went, followed it, made all my turns and got to Durant. I will tell you I wavered again. I got the quarter. But he rescued me at that point. He gives us direction and we can follow his voice. Isaiah 45 says, for this is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. That's you people. He formed the earth. Too. If you create something for your family, don't you appreciate it if they show up and appreciate it? Like dinner? He says, I am the Lord. There is no other. I have not spoken in secret. He isn't hiding from you. He isn't speaking in secret. He's speaking to you. I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak truth and I declare what is right. He speaks truth to you. If you ask him, all you have to do is listen. I'm not going to tell you I didn't argue with him. I did. So isn't this what intercession is? One leading and guiding the other directly to where God wants them to be. In this case, it was Durant and the Holy Spirit told me each and every step. When we intercede for someone, it's exactly the same. The Holy Spirit guides us in each step. And may I point out here that you have to be willing to listen and obey in what you hear. Durant, it turned out, was in the southeastern corner of the state. Not the northeast corner like I thought. I should have known. Southeast Oklahoma State University is there. No, I thought it was in New York. Good thing I listened to the Lord. I might still be growing. <laughs> We need to, when we intercede for someone, we need to have several things in play. Know who God is. Trust that he has your best interest at heart and hit at the forefront of his focus. Be willing to ask him questions along the way, but be willing to hear him. Be obedient. Enjoy the trip. I didn't fuss and fume the whole time. We talked about Moses. Stay the course until you reach your destination. It's a lot easier when praying for someone else. But you cannot love your neighbor more than you love yourself. If you cannot hear for yourself and hear accurately, how can you possibly hear for others and get them to the throne so they can arrive at the destination with all their belongings? You cannot arrive unless you know the way. Have you asked for directions lately? Don't you think it's time to start? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us direction in life. I pray that you would speak clearly 
and let us know who we're supposed to be, where we're supposed to go, and teach us the way. Lord, refine our hearing that we hear you each step. Lord, we give you glory and we give you honor and thank you. You are such a magnificent man. Amen. 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 Anybody who wants to come and greet the greet.